Mormon Stories Podcast is a production of the Open Stories Foundation. All donations to Mormon Stories are fully tax deductible and go directly towards keeping the podcast alive and towards building a community of support for Mormons like you. Come, come, ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy when your way. So I read like, one of the articles I read, it's like they've got the reputation of not drinking or smoking or doing drugs and being Which is devout Mormons. Almost true. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, so I mean, you were aware that that was what people were saying, right? Oh, yeah. It came up a lot. And I think I kind of, I think Brandon and I both like started not to shy away. F- we were proud that we were Mormon. We weren't. But I, we, we were tired of it coming up on interviews. So we would use like, I think I am even, you know, mentioned this before, but like I would, I would say like, uh, you know, you two is Catholic, but that doesn't make them a Catholic band or, you know, any, any sort of band that has a religion that they do in their, in their spare time or in that forms their life or their worldview, but it doesn't affect their music. So we would use that in interviews a lot. Um, Cause that was the thing. I didn't want to be labeled as the Mormon band. It was like, we were labeled as the Mormon band, but we were also labeled as like the killer's friends at the beginning. And that, those were like at the initial thing, those were the two things that we wanted to break, like those stereotypes. So why not the killer's friends? Why isn't that great? I think because they're, when any band or artist that comes out, they're always going to be labeled as somebody else. Like, oh, they're, they sound like that. Most artists, like, it takes, it takes a while to establish your own thing. Like, you know, um, so I, that was just like the go-to comparison. And that- You wanted an independent identity. We wanted an identity. We wanted our own thing. And obviously that just doesn't come right away. Like, unless, in you know, there, there are bands that are able to do that, but a lot of bands, like when they're introduced, they're said, Like, what do they sound like? Oh, they sound like, you know, and we would get like the strokes and the killers a lot. And I knew at my heart that we were, we weren't those bands, but I also liked those bands. So it wasn't like, it got to be a conflict where I was like, I really like those bands, but like, I just, I'm so tired of being compared to them. Like, you know, we're not that, and I don't sing like them. And so it it got a little like agitating and also just like the, being labeled as a Mormon band. But then like, I think we eventually started to embrace, embrace it. Cause it was kind of like, we liked the reaction of like, you're from Provo, Utah, like what's there. And like always having to apologize for Utah or like, no, it's like actually really cool. And like, there's a lot of like art there and cool bands and <laughs> always trying to d- probably making it seem way cooler than it actually is. But <laughs> I, I think it's cool. I like Utah a lot. And I think it has a great charm. But it was interesting to go on an international level and realize how many people still thought that Mormons were polygamous and how, how really like, like as great as the church's image thinks it is, like, I think, I think it's still pretty like, like everyone still thinks like we have multiple wives and, and, you know, and we're, they have a lot of misconstrued thoughts about the church. So that was like, always, I, I felt like I was um, defending it a lot. And that gave me, a, that made me feel the spirit in a way. Like mm-hmm. I felt like I'm still representing the church in a positive light. I'm here in France, you know, doing an interview with someone that's accusing me of being a polygamist, but I'm like, clearly not. And, you know, we would, you know, I would, I would, there was a there was an interview that I stopped because I was tired of being asked about the church, things like that. So like I, I definitely was like I felt like I was being true, being true to the church, being true to my beliefs, while still like also feeling like I'm doing something important by proving that it's not just a cookie cutter religion. And it's there's a different everyone looks different in the church and there's different qualities that people have. So you were kind of taking pride in trying to show Mormonism as bigger and yeah. more diverse and yeah, richer so. and cooler. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe a mission for you a little bit. Yeah, I think so. And I think that became sort of the band thing. And then Chris eventually told us that he was leaving the church and it kind of came as a surprise to us, but I had also known that like 
his brother had come out, um, but he his brother as as gay. Sorry, yeah. As what gay. year? Around, right around Prop Eight, um, and that was really difficult for Chris's the, the Allens, uh, the Allen family, and I remember it really affected his dad. And his dad ended up, you know, leaving the church, and his I think his mom just recently did, but like. Um, you know, and I won't speak to their experience completely, but like what I know of them, cause I, I'm, I'm fairly close to his family, but like, that was a, I was like, wow. But I always felt, I always felt compassion for Chris's situation, but like, it's weird. Cause like that could have been a time where I could have just said, confided in him, like, you know, I, I'm gay too. Or I could have like, been like, I know what your brother's going through and I didn't. And that's that's sort of looking back like weird, like, well, why why did I wait? Why didn't I do it then? You know, like there was no reason why I couldn't have. Like, but, it's like with the missionary on your mission, right? Right. It was this weird. It's a chance to connect that you passed up. Yeah. And so he, you know, he left and we all just assumed, because he had just started dating a girl at the time that wasn't a member and they eventually got married and they're married now and she's wonderful. Um, but they had, I, I, myself and Elaine had always said like, man, too bad Chris like gave up. That sucks. Like, or, oh, it must be because he's having, you know, cause we had also found out he, he, he wasn't a virgin anymore. So we we're like, oh, he, he it must be that, that he's sexually active and he's falling in love with a girl. It's not Mormon. And that's okay. Cause Danny's awesome and they're making it work. And, but we would always kind of just like, we would poke fun a little bit. And uh, and that makes me feel bad looking back on that for sure. Because um, I, had, I had no idea what he was really going through. And and to really look at it in, from a different perspective now, like it's like how, how, how terrifying and, and hard and how hard it is that his whole f- family was going through that. Um, Did he pull you aside and tell you what he was going through and why and how? And No, I think... Isn't that crazy? You guys were so, like childhood friends. I know, and I know. It's the hardest thing in his life. I know. You're spending the most time with him. No, I, I, I have and 24 he's not, hours a day. And he's not cool. telling you what's going on. I know. And you're not telling him what's going I on. Know. <laughs> and you've got something that could totally connect directly with his experience and you don't talk about it. What is that? I know. It's bizarre. What is that? I don't know what that is. It's fear. It's no. We all do it. I'm mean, uh, just yeah, saying yeah, we yeah. all do no, it. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it is bizarre. Like I actually sort of hinted the most to Brand. I remember Brandon and I had a really deep talk because he was kind of going through some stuff where he was like, you know, my I wasn't raised in the church. I love the church. My friends aren't really a lot of my friends that I've had forever aren't Mormon and they're like some of the best people I know. And I know they drink and he's like, I've drank in the past and, and never felt that darkness that we got warned about. And, you know, I like to, I like the camaraderie spirit about that and blah, blah. And I I knew that he, I knew that the pain for him was like, he wanted to be the righteous priesthood holder because that's what his wife, you know, told everyone was like, look, Brandon's a righteous priesthood holder you know, he goes to church every Sunday. Like even, even on tour, he would find a a building to go to and I would occasionally go, but I didn't go as much as he did, but he, you know, so there was a lot of pressure on his end. So I remember confiding him a little bit. Like he's like, I was like, yeah, I think I'm, I think I might be bi. Like, I think I I think there's something to it. And I think he thought I maybe was making an advance at him. So it was probably the last time we ever talked about that. <laughs> Didn't go so well. He, I think he said something to the effect of like, well, you know, I don't get into that. So <laughs> I was like, uh, all right. <laughs> uh, he's one of my close compadres, but like, I think he just like, at that time, just like, and I was so worried about thinking that he thought I was coming on to him. I was like, and I wanted like, so I never brought it up again, really. And, and, uh, and that was that. And so, um, yeah. Real quick, what's it like to go from a, a regional band to getting a record deal to then, is Animal the biggest song you've ever released? No, a song called Everybody Talks is the, is the big jam. 
Okay, but but Animals, Animal was big. Right? Animal was our breakthrough, breakthrough, and it got Did it go platinum. It went or number gold? one, number one, number one on in the alternative, alternative, but yeah, alternative radio, it, number thirteen on across the board. Everybody talks went to number six on on pop radio on on the Hot 100. So I guess uh, stats wise, okay. it became. But Animal, what a what a huge massive. First- yeah. Crazy. So talk, just talk, just Crazy. for those who are interested in the music industry, what's it like? How does that, what does that do? You're like Changes you're playing in Provo, you're playing in LA dives, record deal. Changes everything. What? Like how? Like uh, instantly went on a tour, instantly got, went on a national tour um, with a band called 30 Seconds to Mars. Jared Leto is the singer of that band. Uh, Jared Leto of you know everyone knows Jared Leto but he no I don't I've never oh Jared's uh, he's he's a pretty famous actor and he won the Oscar two years ago for the role in Dallas Buyers Club oh cool um, he's playing the Joker in the new Suicide Squad movie oh so anyway he's he's a big uh, big actor and had a really really big band they took us out on tour another band called Mute Math was on that tour bands we looked up to like they were big bands and we just owned every single night. We owned opening up for those bands and I um, immediately went on another tour with 30 Seconds to Mars that fall. Are those are those grinds like you're playing every night? Oh yeah. How yeah. does your voice survive as oh, a lead vocalist? Intense. How do you what do you have to do? I eventually switched to inner monitors which really helped. Um, that got where where instead of using the wedges in front of the stage and relying on that cuz that to hear yourself? Yeah. So there's like monitors on the stages and side fills on big stages. And they're basically essentially like monitors or speakers that like feed what you're playing, what the audience is hearing, but feed it to you so that the stage sound and the audience sound are very similar. Um, But that gets super taxing on your voice when you're relying on that. So I eventually switched to inner monitors, but it it was hard. And if you got ever got sick on tour, like, but I also, I think that part of that, and I, I, you know, is, myself as a punk rock guy but I think from that punk rock background of like going to shows where where it was more about the spirit and the energy of the show and maybe maybe the sound wasn't great but like people were so into it that was the like culture that I wanted to cultivate around the band do you have to like watch what you eat and do the lemon thing I was and unhealthy the tea and- I was unhealthy uh I was vegan but I was eating Taco Bell every day so it was like how do you um, eat Taco Bell as a vegan uh, bean burritos. Okay. Yeah. I really, I, that's, I, you cut me open in 2010 and I was just like bean burritos. <laughs> so gross. Uh, yeah. But I was also, it's not like you instantly are rich when you have a hit song. Like you, you're not, you're not. So when you sign that first record label, you're not rich. No, maybe back in the eighties, early nineties, maybe even late nineties, but like record deals are different and it was good money to us because like we'd never seen money like that um so it was great but it was also like the band needs a fund so that we can go on tour we have to buy a van we have to buy a trailer we have to buy better equipment because we're playing bigger venues now so you can sign a major record label have a top 20 hit and not be rich absolutely okay. absolutely there's there's tour support um from labels we had a but but that's not like fake money like that money still has to be recouped somehow we had success so we were able to recoup but um but yeah there's a there's sort of this illusion that once you're on the radio or doing tv shows or you know or famous that that like all of a sudden you're like also rich and that's like not the case like i would go back home to provo for like you know two weeks in between tours and living on an air mattress with those friends that i had lived with before we got signed and made it big. So it was like, you know, and I did that for like three or four years and we, we were, we were touring the world. We were going everywhere. And like, I would, you know, and it, we would be put up in these nice places, be taken out to dinner. I probably gained like 20 pounds that first record just because of all the free food that we were bought. Um, which, you know, was its own thing. I, I kind of have body dysmorphia. I definitely have body dysmorphia. So that was like a, a whole issue too, but tell our listeners what that is. So it's not like an eating disorder, but in a way it's, but in a way it affects what I see in the mirror and I still suffer from it for sure. Um, but there'll be days where I'll, especially back then in the heart of it, when I wasn't dealing with a lot of my 
inner stuff, I I always saw like a like a fat guy. Like and I always saw somebody that I didn't want to see and I always saw someone you know, I immediately could pick out like flaws and and things that I hated about myself. And I, I'm sure to a degree everyone goes through that, but like it was on an unhealthy level. And this it, is kind of what Michael Jackson had, right? But maybe more severe. Maybe, yeah. I, you know, I t- to me, I just would never see what people saw, and to a degree, I still do that. But I have, you know, I definitely remind myself, and um, maybe that's why I take selfies. I don't know, <laughs> so I can have proof that. Oh, yo, you looked okay yesterday, so it's all good. It's real trippy, but so that definitely was a thing for me. And being on stage in front of, you know, thousands of people, going from like anonymity to like being this like, and I on stage, I was nothing like I am talking to you or, and I, I it's like this thing that goes on and I just become this entertainer. And um, I think a lot of people thought that I was gonna be that way off stage, this wild, party guy and and I'm not I'm a very you know I am a pretty quiet um quiet even soft-spoken guy most of the time and so that was weird and I was I was really finding out a lot about my identity on stage in front of people for the first time and that was a trip when I started to I became a little more sexual on stage and my band, I remember pulling me aside a few times, like, "Hey, what you're what you're doing, how you're dancing, or what you're saying isn't in line with the rest of what the band wants you to be doing. So, like, you probably have to tone that down." And so, again, I think the sh- the shame part comes in, and 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 then these f- these friends that you're in a band with that you love, they're saying they're not approving. So, approving of what you're doing necessarily, but but the crowd's loving it and you're like, you know, you're, you're making these, these, you're getting attention, you know, like people are, are really into what you're doing. And like media is, is saying, wow, like that guy's got it or blah, blah. So it's really, it's hard. Like you're, that was definitely the beginnings of like my, I think my mental break. So just because I'm curious, what is it about performing on stage that would call you to express things? I'm thinking Mick Jagger, right? Just express yeah. more sexually. What? Why? Why sexual? Why sexuality as a performer? This may seem obvious. It may be a dumb question. Neon Tree songs, like I, I wrote, like Animal is a pretty sexy song. Like I, I know it's, it's. Uh, that song that song's about sex, sexuality it is uh i think a lot of the songs i wrote had sexual overtones um maybe i didn't use the words graphically maybe they were maybe it's just vague enough to like oh this is a fun song so who cares but like to me like i was i was writing what i knew and what i felt at that time and and but so you, that would come you, out you hadn't been super sexual up until that point like little moments right mm, but but those moments i was there was a lot going on okay, yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah but but it had been more a history of pushing that down yeah than a history of expressing it naturally it. came out to be honest like um i've always been a performer and always subscribed to the idea that like you let the music flow through you and like so that's just what i would do and i think is it a way to express that when you can't express it sometimes in other ways or to me, it was like, uh, you know, getting dressed up for a show and um, being provocative. And, you know, my my rock star heroes taking the gospel out of that, like looking up to, you know, Bowie and Morrissey. And there was a sexiness to their performances and like that I was always into. And, and I think there were times where I felt like I had something to prove to because this was like back when we were still you know, oh, I know that song, but what are these Neon Trees guys all about? Or, you know, and now we're not performing for Mormons anymore because it's like a lot of the time we were performing in Provo and Utah, so like everyone was like, so you could kind of cater to that audience, but now it was like we were a national band and like people didn't even care like what church you were from. Like a lot of people just like, is this a good band or is this not a good band? And so there were a lot of times where I felt like I had to, I had to be like, 
you know, a lot of times where I probably wasn't being true to even like myself, I was just kind of like giving the crowd what you think they want, what they wanted to being a show, being a showman. Um, yeah, there, uh, those early days, probably the first two records, those tours, there were many times where we got into arguments after and definitely times where I think Elaine sometimes forgets that she's on stage. And so like, you can see it in her face when she's like not stoked on something that I've said. And I'm like, wait, like the crowd can also see your face, but there were times <laughs> where she would like, definitely like, like make it known that she's not stoked about what I said. I was watching an Eagles documentary the other day and yeah. Henley and, you know, Fry are like swearing at each other between songs. Like it, it can get pretty intense. Yeah. Even yeah. On stage. There's, we were got, we all are very good at giving each other looks that we, you don't have to speak. We just, you know what we're saying, <laughs> which I, I totally get her position though. Like it's fine. Like there were many times where she's like, this is not the band I signed up for. Like, and so I was like, all right, um, I'm going to hone that again or I'm uh, okay. I promise. And, um, you know, it was, this was also kind of when I, you know, I had stopped wearing my garments and so I wasn't really wearing underwear cause I didn't know anything about underwear, uh, other than like garments were my underwear. And so like, I wasn't really wearing underwear. So there was times where I was just like mooning the entire band <laughs> because like I've been over to like shake someone's <laughs> hand or get into it. And like, <laughs> they just saw way too much. So say no to crack. So I understand. I wasn't the easiest, <laughs> easiest character to be around all the time. Uh, and it got progressively harder for me because your li life catches up with you. Your everything catches up with you eventually. And like it caught up with me in a, in a really negative way. Well, it's got to, I mean, I want to follow up on that, but it's got to be this huge head trip to be the front man for a, for a national, for a global famous yeah. rock band, right? It's hard, man. Does it screw, what does it do to your brain, your personality? What does that do to be Mick Jagger, to be Bowie, to be John Lennon or whatever? You yeah. Know? And I, I, Bono. I would, I would feel completely honored to be considered one of those people at, at some point in my life. But so in no way do I think I'm as important or iconic as those people, but like, I mean, in that role and just in that role. Yeah. I think for me, uh, you know, I, I would try to explain to them, like, I'm the one with the microphone. Like, like I'm the one you guys are like, you know, you're in your spots, but like, I have to like carry this show. Like I have to, and, and we're playing stages, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 50 feet bigger than we've ever played before. Like there's so much space that I have to fill, you know? And like these things are, I'm naturally like, there were times where like, we've never even seen you dance like that. Like, like you, you know? And I was like, I don't know. Like, it's just, it's just like, what's, what's coming, you know? And I think there are parts of them that loved it because they saw it was working and that's it. You're just trying to make it work, right? Making it work. And it, it really, it wasn't calculated. It was just very much like, this is what's well, artistic, happening. Yeah, right? It's, absolutely. Absolutely. And it was hard. You know, you never, as an artist, I don't want to have to over explain what, what I'm doing or why no one wants to, no one wants to in general, but like, I think artists and, and artistic creative people don't want to have to explain like what they're doing, what they're producing, what they're putting out there should be explanation enough. Um, or it shouldn't, and that's fine, but that's what it is. And, and so it sucked having to explain myself to the people I was like making this art with or making this music with or having this ex experience with. So it definitely, there, it definitely, uh, I mean, what was even the question of that? We're just, just being the front man, how does it pressure. change your personality? Yeah. Um, I don't think it changed me off stage. Uh, like you, you hear about like, Trashing hotels and no, no, sex no, no, and no, drugs no, no, no. and groupies and no, like, like I said, I, I, crazy wild. Living. I think that's what people expected. Like I remember there was there started to get you know drug rumors like that. I and I it was like I'd never even like it had been since I was like seventeen that I had even like smoked pot or something. So it was like none. There was no substance abuse. There was no like big rock star parties afterwards. It was actually a very lonely. It became to be a very lonely existence because. Like I said, I think all four of us, there was things going on in our life secretly, all very different things. But I think what that does is like, we would all just go to our hotel rooms or our bunks on the bus 
and there wasn't a lot of camaraderie where before there was because we were in a van together. And so the more, the more popular we got and the more successful we got and the more opportunity we got, the more isolated I think we all felt. From each other. From each other, yeah. Really bad. Um, I you remember, just show up, do your thing, yeah. do the set. Yeah, I started split. hanging out more with the crew or like with our tour manager than, than my, my own bandmates. And there's gotta be a point where you're kind of sick of each other. Is that true or not? Where you're just, yeah. you've been together so much for so long. But I don't want to paint it like, like there was bad blood. I just think like, it's, it, it was what it was. Like music brought us together. Music made us friends. The band made us, made us come together. Um, and I think the more forced stuff was like the friendship parts. I think now, like even three years, or, well, 2010, so like six years later, looking at that sort of initial time period. And now, like, I think we're like closer than ever. And, but I still think there are like, there are things I don't know about any of, I, you know, any of my band that, yeah, are, are those tours fun or yeah. are they a drag or both? They're or? a blast when you're playing the shows. and then So the shows themselves. And they're a blast when you're like, you're tr- they're, they were mostly a blast for me. I think for some of us there weren't because I think, especially as people started having kids and kids were getting older, like Elaine started to have a family and that put a strain and she, she missed her kids, but she also loved being in a touring successful band so she wanted to make those work but that i think it got more like she focused on that and she in her downtime she liked facetiming with her kids and her husband and keeping that you know established and that relationship solid and same with brandon and um so i don't know like for me it was a blast because i was like this single guy living life exploring things like you know having experiences um but then there were t- it was definitely lonely like it was definitely isolating do you ever get sick of singing the same songs over and over and over or not no. really yeah i think right now i'm a little at that place not sick of it i love my band's music um i don't get tired of it because it's what it does what I, the, what i see the crowd how the crowd reacts if the crowd got tired of it then i would be like okay it's time to hang out the hat on this song or whatever but like when we launch an animal like it used to be the song we'd close on when it was the only song people knew of ours but then once we got a few more hits and then records were more familiar and you know more recent tours like we could put animal like fourth in the set list and and people would be like what they're already playing like this song and then you know just to see reactions to certain songs and like see a room full of like strangers or or the front row or kids have been coming to shows for years, like still singing, like with such vigor and you, know, you can't get tired of that. Like you're never, I'm never going to get tired of that. If people are showing up and stoked. What about what groupies? There's always this myth about groupies that yeah. they're hanging around that they're yeah. following you guys around. Like, does that happen or? I think because we put off, we put off and, and mostly had a, a clean cut image. We didn't go out to bars after we didn't really party um, at, well, none of us were partying. There wasn't the drug or alcohol party lifestyle. So instead we would go get food or go to restaurants after shows or whatever. And we would see fans. And so in that way, our groupies were more just like fans that like, that, that got to know us on a level that, you know, that maybe some fans don't get to. Like we definitely, there are definitely fans early on that like, and I'm not taking I'm not taking sole credit, but I I know of a small handful of people that have joined the church because of neon trees. I know a small handful of people that have moved to Provo, Utah because of neon trees. Whether or not that was solely because of neon trees or just because like I don't know I you have to ask them, but that's that's fascinating. That's interesting. You know, I don't know. It's, and and in a way, going back to that is like oh, look, we're doing good. Like, you know, we're doing a good thing, even though there's like so much chaos okay. behind the scenes. But So as long as you're performing on those tours, you're loving it. Yeah. The downtime can Anytime be Anytime I have to be Tyler Glenn, not the Neon Trees guy, you know, that was when it would get, it would catch up a little bit. Like days off, if I could like, 
you know, international touring was great because it was like days off felt like vacation trips. So you could like go. You could tour around. Go explore. Yeah. We were, a lot of the time when we got to the point where we were able to and like financially, we were able to block out like days like, oh, we're going to be in Indonesia. Let's make sure we have four days in Bali to like hang and not just like go from tour to tour. And so, you know, we especially uh, the second record was like the sophomore records always like the record everyone looks to like, cool, you got your big break. Now what? And uh, when everybody talks became the hit it did and, and took us into that, that took us into like a real pop pop spot where animal became a pop, a pop song and like a big, a song for that, that radio world. But uh, everybody talks, we were, we were on a commercial, we, you know, it was for, for Buick and we were in the commercial and we played ourselves and I had a speaking part and, and it, the, the commercial debuted during March Madness of that year, 2012. And so our, that was the first time where it went from like the Neon Trees guy to like, oh, Tyler, people started to know my name and, and know what we were about and know who does that song? Like it was now like, oh, Neon Trees is in a commercial. and for every like great glowing comment, there were like millions. And that's when I first realized millions of negative comments. And that was when I first realized like, okay, I can't, I can't look at Twitter, Google anymore. Cause it used to be like, st- uh, get off stage, go on Twitter, see how people like the show. And then once it got to the point where it was like, like you became, you became big enough where people of all sides had an opinion. It wasn't just people liking you, writing about you. Um, that's when I sort of realized, okay, we're in that place now where I have to not, no more Googling the entries. <laughs> <laughs> One more question about touring. Um, yeah. So name some of the biggest bands you've toured with. Um, uh, My Chemical Romance, uh, Duran Duran. And these are like full tours. We've played with a lot of artists, but um, um, Maroon 5, was a full tour. And then most of the bands, like we started right around the Maroon 5 tour, which was like on our record picture show, our second record, uh, we started doing a lot of our own touring. So then it, 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 you were the it became where we were the headliner. So like, um, I mean, we've shared the stage at festivals and stuff with like all kinds of greats. Who? Uh, um oh like we like Weezer and Social Distortion and and uh and uh Lady Gaga and and um oh I don't know like I hate to say like everyone but like like everyone that was I don't know popular. Taylor Swift That's brought how. you on stage, right? Taylor Taylor was a yeah, I met her so that was incredible. She she uh, she was a fan of our band and had been for a while. The, the first time I knew she was Taylor Swift was a fan of our band was in 2011. She played at uh, Energy Solutions Arena and she covered Animal Acoustic at, at her show. It was on her Fearless tour. And uh, Emily Campbell, Brandon's wife, was there just as a fan of Taylor Swift with her daughter. And uh, there she is playing Animal and the whole arena is singing Animal. This was about 2011, so it was kind of like we were still growing. Animal had become a hit, but and uh, and at the meet and greet, Taylor was like, "Yeah, like I I know who you are. I know like I know all the Neon Trees names. I love this song and this song. It was like songs that she probably shouldn't know. So she was like a legit fan. And then uh, a year later, we were on tour with or two years later, we were on tour with Maroon Five, and the Staples Center show we did with. Uh, Taylor was there and she was backstage and, and we met and she's like, Hey, I, I kind of want you to like join. Cause she had started doing this thing where she would bring guest artists out. And she did that a lot on this last tour, this 1989 tour. This was for her album red and uh, her red tour. And she's like, yeah, I want you to come sing at one of the big shows. I was like, all of the big shows, like you're playing stadiums, like all of your shows. Are big shows. <laughs> like, okay, cool. So I kind of like wrote it off and she, I remember her texting me a couple weeks later and like I was flipping out cause I was like, 
guys, look, I have Taylor Swift's number. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, it, totally like ch- joke bragging. Like it wasn't like that big of a deal, but it was, it was a big deal. And she, uh, she flew me out to s- sing uh, Everybody Talks with her and her band at, at, the, at the show. And then she invited us out on tour. We did her whole Australian tour. So it was like a three week vacation with Taylor Swift on in Australia. You were on tour with Taylor Swift? Yeah, in Australia, 2013. What? Yeah, it was uh, summer for Australia, so it was December. Um, my birthday, I had my birthday in New Zealand. Uh, she had her birthday in, in uh, December in Australia, in Sydney. It was crazy uh, playing stadiums and arenas in, in Australia with Taylor. So it was, it was dope. So when you when you tour with a, another band, yeah. even a bigger band, yeah. do you get to become friends with them? Sometimes. Do you, do you hang out or is it totally like in your... It's all you about know? it's all about your vibes and like if if it's natural. And with her, like she's like the... Like I know everyone loves Taylor Swift, but like there's a reason because she's like, I think she's the real deal. Obviously she's the real deal, but like she's like the kindest, nicest person. Like she doesn't have to be. And I, I'm sure there, everyone has their sides, but like um, there wasn't any f- fakeness about, about her. And she didn't have to be like, she could have been nice and then like gone to her trailer, but she, like she would stop by and say hello. And we would, we would chat and she, you know, she wouldn't like invite us like she invited me to the, the prayer circles before. She like, prays? They were like loose prayers. Like they were more just like folk. Yeah, but it was like a prayer circle. But she invited me to that like before they would go on and like stuff like that. So it's with her, like she was awesome. Um, Maroon 5 was awesome. We, we felt like we were, you know, comrades. Uh, um, my Chemical Romance was awesome. There, There's other, art, like Duran Duran, we toured with like The Offspring. They were like bands that would sort of like fly in and then fly out. And we would see them and they were always really nice and stoked we were on tour with them. And occasionally we'd see our set, but like, you know, I totally get it. Cause I've, being a headlining band in that position, like I've, I've not always been like the warmest, most like let's hang out with everybody guy. But so I get it. It's, you know, it's your life. And sometimes yeah, yeah. you don't want to be around people, yeah. but it can be, it can be fun for sure. Um, okay, here's a super weird question, okay. a little bit risky. Oh. So, like, there's different categories of stardom, let's just say. Sure. Let's just say A through F or whatever. Okay. So, like, A would be who? You 2 or Lady Gaga? Like, like, who are the biggest bands? Like, like right now, uh, like, Taylor Swift, Gaga, um, you know, Connie West, uh, um, Band wise, like I think, like maybe two years ago, it was Imagine Dragons, and um, they and then they got their start in Pro as well, which is, you know, they and, would have been on the eight eight. eight they, I mean, th- for a rock band like in two thousand, you know, fourteen, fifteen, like that's playing like selling out an arena tour, like that's a huge deal. Like you know, unfortunately, rock music's not maybe the most popular style of music these days. But they came through Provo, right? Imagine Dragons. Yeah. I, it's funny, Dan Dan uh, went to the Omaha, Nebraska mission as well as me. He's the lead singer? He's a singer. He uh, raised Mormon from a big, you know, the Reynolds are a big Mormon family in Vegas. Um, and he used to be a, a Neon Trees fan. He, he would come to our early shows and he was just like a fan at the shows. And I remember him. And then um, Imagine Dragons and Neon Trees. We kind of became competitive, but like not like to me, it was never real. It was just sort of like, I think people thought we didn't like each other, but it's like, to me, it was like, I didn't think about it in that way. And I I, I thought it was amazing. Their, their accomplishments, like they, you know, it was great. And it, you know, sometimes it was like, why did they claim Vegas? But Dan, Dan's originally from Vegas and so are half the band. So like, you know, there, but there were times where it's like, oh, but we saw you start in Provo and we know you were like a BYU band and we know like, we know you sounded this way, but it's like, who cares? Like we sounded different sometimes. And But they came years after you. They came a couple years after, yeah. But maybe you guys helped set the stage a tiny bit. Maybe. I won't take ownership for what they yeah. did because, but, but I, I think we definitely like, yeah, we were one of the, one of the, you know, first bands out of Provo. So, yeah. So in terms of like, and again, this is a weird question, but like in terms of like, you know, making it big, 
if they were an ABCD, where would you guys say you guys reached? Can you say you hit A, B, like second tier? What? And it, I'm just curious, like how, if you guys think in that way of like, if they're sort of like, well, you made it here, but then I there's don't kind think of a next about, level. I don't think about that way from day to day, but I know being in it enough, learning what I've learned at my time in this industry, like I realize this is like, this isn't just a passion now. This is like, I think this is the thing I'm good at and it's it's worked and I want to continue. And I, I've also discovered like, I'm... I'm most comfortable creating. I'm most comfortable writing music and performing. I'm, I love it. It, it drives me. It's my passion. So it's more than, it's gotten way more than just being like a cool band touring or getting to say you opened up for this band. You know, it, it, it's really become like this thing that I want, like, I want to be thoughtful. I want to grow. I want to, I want to, it's not about fame. It never has been, but I want to be able to continue to feel like I'm getting better. And I think sometimes a sign of, of progress and success is, is obviously popularity and, um, neon trees. Like, I don't know if I, if I guess, I guess if I analyze it, like there was definitely a time where we were like, like an A band. So still at a stadium kind of thing? No, like, no. So maybe not an A band. Maybe, maybe like a no, I don't. I, and that's, that's still an A. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, amazing, yeah. but. Um, I don't know. Like for what active- I'm doing is we've, we wrote, we've written three songs that I, that still are, that have been deemed modern classics. So I'll go, I can walk in a- any given week I'm going to hear one of our songs on the radio or hear it at a store or hear it. And, and it's gotten past the point where I have to explain like, Oh, we're the band that did this song. Like most of the time I'm able to say neon trees and people know granted. I realize there's like a whole world of people that they don't even listen to music and only know Adele, which is fine too. <laughs> but, but for like people that like love music and then people that are even just like mainstream music listeners, but like still love music. Like I feel like, we're a band that people know. And the big three, Animal, Everybody Talks, and Sleeping with a Friend? Sleeping with a Friend, yeah. Are those the big three? Those are the ones that went platinum. If, so I guess if we're counting. Did you say double platinum or platinum? Uh, Everybody Talks went six times, which And is platinum bizarre. means what? It's a million. Uh, platinum is a million. So it's bit, It's crazy. It's crazy to think that. And I think Animal went five or six as well. It's weird to... Think of it in that, and I don't, I want you to know, and I want viewers to know, I don't think about that from day to day. Like, I don't. I wouldn't think you would. I don't. Like, uh, I keep my accomplishments on my walls, but it's more of like, because I'm I'm really self-deprecating naturally, and so I need to, like, be reminded. Because there are times where, like, a week, it will be a dull week, and I'll be like, and I'll feel like, oh, man, I haven't done anything with my life. You know what I mean? I'm serious. Like, like I haven't. Oh, or man. like we're washed up. We're. I'm 32. Or, or, or yeah, like that fear of like, can we go back out on tour and will it be the same? And, um, but then it's like, no, like our last record is our highest charting and things are good and it's okay. Like we've made. So pop psychology record. hit what what number? Uh, number six. Okay. On the top. Um, yeah, it's. It, my my thing is it's as long as we're continuing to grow um and we are you know it's just like i look back at some of the like the like the breakthrough moments and you only get those once like you know what i mean like you only get to hear your song one the first time you hear your song on the radio you only get that once or the first time i mean it, we played jay leno the tonight show seven times is that good or bad like that's pretty awesome. That's good because <laughs> we got, to, obviously he was a fan and let us play a show, but like we've played it seven times. Like, should, should we be the most popular band in the world now? I don't know. But you look back as a teenager and you're like, oh man, if we play this show, like that means we've made it. And now I look at it and I've played, we've played every talk show. Fallon? Played Fallon. We've played, we played everything but Colbert because Colbert's new. But that's crazy. We haven't played SNL. That's the one, you know, that's. Is that because you haven't wanted to or no, they haven't asked? Are you or? kidding? No. Yeah. That's like, like 
that's the golden prize, you know, that, and that, so that to me, like, you know, we've, we've never won a Grammy there. There are those like accolades in the industry that don't, shouldn't mean anything and kind of don't really, but they also mean a lot. So it's kind of like, yeah, there are those benchmark moments and it's nice to look out and to see there are still a few that to do. And then there, and to realize I'm not tired and there's so many people that have yet to hear hear our music like I don't know it just doesn't feel like it's definitely not a feeling of washed up like I there's none of that feeling but it's we live in a day and age where if you go away for a month people are like when are you putting your record out or like or you just put your record out and someone on Twitter or like fans will be like when's the next album coming out like they're already they've already listened to your record and memorized and are done with it because there's so much music and and everyone's ADD and everyone can get everything right away and it's changed the way people tour and so it's it's a pro I think it's a pro a product of like or it's just like we're in a moment in time where music's weird the industry's weird and and we've put out three records that have been successful and my bandmates are having babies and don't need to be going on a tour this year so we should why not like I got to like stuff on my walls and like see friends I hadn't seen in years. And so this know. is the first year you haven't been on tour yeah. for like seven years, right? I know. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. The last tour we went on was over the, this last summer and it was like a, it was like a fan tour. Like we, we went and played like, I think the biggest places we played booked were like 2000 to 2,500 cap rooms. Cause we wanted to keep it. We want to make sure they were sold out and we wanted to make sure that, it was like ride or die fans, like fans that like loved the band and we wanted to make it feel special for them. So is that your favorite audience to play for? Well, yeah, obviously. Um, but people who are really into it. Oh yeah. I mean, when they, it's like being fed, it's amazing. It's edifying. So, yeah. So I, I interrupted you. You were saying that for a while you were kind of an a band, at least within the context of the year, you know, you like, you guys were one of the top bands. Like, most played song in Australia in 2011. Uh, won Billboard Music Award in 2012. Uh, so that, you know, 2010, if you go back, like alternative hits, we would be on, you know, we were on two of the now compilations. We were on a kids, we were on kids bop CDs. Like we had made it, we had crossed into that level of like acknowledgement where, where, yeah, it's meaningful. And that means a lot. Is that the only thing that fuels me? No. And it of course. Still isn't, but. But yeah, like I, I know I feel like I'm apologizing for being that's, awesome. That's the self for being awesome. That's the, <laughs> yeah. It's like I'm always having to like shame myself or check myself. Like, but no, I'm really proud of what we've done. Yeah, I think at, at one point, and you know, who knows? Maybe go out on, on tour again in a couple of years, and or whenever. See if they're still if the yeah. magic's still there. If the magic's still there. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so your first two albums are huge. Yeah. And you're you're probably writing pop psychology. Yeah. And something led to your decision to come out. And I can't help but think how risky that and first of all, you wouldn't just be coming out to the world. You had to start probably by coming out to your parents and yeah. to your bandmates. Yeah, no. Um, and then to Mormons, right? And your yeah. fan base yeah. and then the world. And I'm thinking like two really successful albums. Do you screw with that? Right. Do yeah. you, do you even go there? Yeah. And so talk, take us back to whatever point you want to, to talk about whatever you think is important to talk about that leads up to that decision. Cause I imagine, and I'm, that's 2014, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing that a lot went into that. Absolutely. Like, I mean, it, everything led up to that moment, I think. Uh, um, Go back as far as you want to take us to that point. I had, um, I had, you know, being a successful band, I'd, I was living my dream that I'd dreamt of since I was a teenager and it, and while it was amazing and crazy and I was getting to do all the things I've ever wanted to do and all my family and 
friends were flipping out and hundred percent on board and stoked. And I felt, I felt for the first time, Oh, maybe this is what wholeness feels like. Maybe this is, this is, Oh, this is what happiness looks like. Awesome. And then, and then I'm like, okay, well, why am I lonely? And why do I go to bed mad a lot? And why do I still think, you know, why, why do I still think like I'm going to end up, um, like for a while I told people I'd be like, I'd be 55 with dogs living on a beach somewhere and I alone and I'd be totally happy. And, and my mom would always be like, you know, I think you need to think about finding somebody that, so that you have that person in your life, like that you can call. And, and I, I would say that too. I was like, yeah, I, I do need somebody. Like I, I'm super lonely. And, um, and your bandmates are getting married and having kids. Yeah. Everyone's kind of moving on with their lives as far as like able to make the band work, but also like establishing roots and, you know, and I'm the single guy, (laughs) I'm the single guy and kind of okay with that. But then also like knowing I'm using the crutch, like using a crutch, like, um, and I remember, uh, waking up one morning on, on the bus, we were actually driving to Salt Lake to our, it was our tour stop in Salt Lake and year approximately probably 2012. Okay. 2013, probably 2013. No, it's 2013. And, uh, and, uh, calling my manager and I was just like, I was like, I can't do this band anymore. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, blah, blah. It was like height of, of basically popularity. Like, you know, booked for, booked for uh, Dick Clark's Rock and Eve Times Square, New Year's <laughs> Eve, like, like all these big looks. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, uh, this isn't right. Like I've realized I'm like, I'm, I, I thought maybe this is what I was supposed to do. And I just don't, I don't think it is. Cause like, I think I'm in danger of really kind of going mad and I'm, um, <clears throat> and, and I'm kind of being vague, but being specific and he can tell and I'm, I'm kind of crying and um, he's like something, something I kind of appreciate, but always like um, sort of didn't appreciate was they were always like, it's going to be okay. Just, you know, keep to your commitments and keep going. We, you know, this is awesome. You're just having a bad day. But there was, there was never like, I was like basically screaming, someone needs to stop this, this ride. I need a break. Um, and I felt like no one was, no one was hearing me. Was it more than just being exhausted? No, it, 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 it was, it was the compartmentalizing. It was, it had all come to a head at that point. And so that's exhausting. It's pure exhaustion. It's, uh, it's living in your body, but not wanting to be in your body kind of thing. Like sincerely, that's what it became. And it sucked. Cause like I had reached, I had was living my dream. I was accomplishing things. I was, finally had money for the first time in my life. I was able to like not borrow money from my parents or family or friends. Like, like I was like, dude, I've, I'm successful and I'm, I'm not even 30 years old. Like all my friends are still wondering what they're going to do with their lives or I shouldn't be complaining, but I'm like so bummed out. And it's so cliche, right? Yeah. But what's that? So part of it is the compartmentalization. I think a lot of, of it is. Yeah. It, I, I legitimately like going back to that, that idea, like I legitimately thought like, like I was, I either need a demon cast out of me or like, I'm serious. Like I, I need, or I need to quit the band and go back to church and like, like full on, like it was never about like, not like I'd always believed wholeheartedly that the church is true. And, but I, I was like, I'm clearly neglecting prayer. I'm clearly not communicating with my only father. I'm clearly not communicating with myself and being honest with myself. There's, there's a lot that I need to go through. And I remember, I remember it was on this kind of harder tour. We were opening for a band called the offspring and they're, they're an old punk band and neon trees is not a punk band. And we were on this like U S tour with the offspring and their crowd was terrible to us. They, and not every show, but, but it was one of those shows where we really had to win over the crowd every night. And if we didn't, then you really knew that you, that we hadn't. And, and we were giving our all, we were playing really well. And we had, you know, two big hit songs and 
but that didn't matter to that crowd because it was kind of like that like yeah but we're just here to see you know this band and that was the vibe we got and so i started to get way more into the rock star thing again and i started swearing a lot more on stage and like um being really rude to the audience um i remember multiple times spitting on people which i'm not just because you're mad or i'm mad i'm mad at myself i'm mad that we're out on this tour i'm mad that like it feels like a waste of time because we're we have if you're so big why are you opening for some random punk band well, they're not random. They're like a. I'm sorry, I, I'm betraying my ignorance. No, no, you're okay. They're a big, they're a big punk. Band. They're like a, a le- they're they're a legendary pop punk okay. band, like slash used to be way more punk, kind of you know, pl- playing big places. But they this was also a tour where they they realized they weren't as relevant as they thought they were, and so so that we were actually drawing drawing equal to or more at times uh, in certain areas. And that really felt good. But then the next show, it was like some random place and it was all their fan. So it's just like, it felt like we were put on this tour where it's like, wait, everybody talks is like the biggest, one of the biggest songs of the year. We're playing New Year's Rock and Eve. Like, like we're, you know, top 10 big songs list of the end of the year of, you know, blah, blah. Like we should, we shouldn't be on this tour. And then it, it was a matter of like, I'm not happy, and 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 so it's just kind of like this this weird time. And um, you spit on. I was spit on a lot of people. <laughs> I was a spitter. Is that just like? It's it was just like assuming the role. Like it was it was a little bit self sabotage in a way too. I think. I just don't think of you as someone who oh, would ever yeah. do that, right? Yeah. So that's a character thing, is it? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely like that's punk rock Tyler. This is like rock star Tyler. I'm gonna give this crowd what they want. They, you know, oh, uh, like you know, I'm gonna be a little quote. Unquote, I'm gonna to be crass. I'm gonna be a dick. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be what they. That's rock and roll. Yeah, and that's not not me through and through. But like you know, I and my band hated that. Elaine wasn't on that tour as well because she had she was off having a baby, and so. There was that aspect where she was not happy that we were on that tour. And then I realized maybe halfway through, like, we don't need to be doing this tour. So we have Elaine pissed at us. We're not too happy about this this run. We shouldn't be here. Are our managers looking out for us? A lot of anxiety. Like, um, it was just an anxious time. I'm not happy with who I am. I'm not being true to myself. And so I... I after we played our last show in Vegas uh, on that tour, terrible show. Um, I, I've never given up on a, on a show ever. Like I've always persevered and I've never walked off stage, but I basically gave up halfway through and um, did the songs, but just felt completely like, completely like exhausted and, um, that night my bass player Brandon lit into me. It was just like, I'm so tired of being in this band with you. Like, and I'm paraphrasing, but I remember him just like launching into me. It was like the last thing I, I needed to hear was like one of my like, you know, friends and my brother and my bandmate. And like, I was like, oh man, like, n- like my manager's not hearing me. My bandmates aren't getting it. I do not want to be here. And I, I wrote, I called my mom. I was like, I was like, I, I need help. I need you to find a therapist or something. Like I need to go talk to somebody. Cause I'm, I've literally think I'm lo- like losing my mind. And I wrote a letter to my band and management and said, I'm not, I'm not touring until, and we had a, a tour planned and I said, no, we're not, we're not doing this. Um, and, uh, went home and um, like that week went, into a therapist in Pleasant Grove. Um, That's like stopping the momentum. Completely. Like you're, you're on the, you know, you're, you hit it big, you're riding it hard. And then all of a sudden you're saying, I'm stopping this train. And, uh, how how hard is that? How crazy is that? I I had so much guilt. Um, and maybe it was a lot, maybe it was make made up guilt that I just put on myself, but like, I definitely, I knew it was what I needed to do, if that makes sense. Like I You're kn- saving your life, basically. Um, it's 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 uh it's fight or flight or uh survival. Sink or swim or, it's sink, yeah. yeah, it's survival. It's I feel like every sort of drastic thing I've ever done in my life probably has been out of 
survival and it looks weird from the outside, but it's like, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm at my, my end. Um, so I sympathize like just to detour just a tiny bit, but I sympathize with artists that, that I get like a lot of people say, Oh, that artist's exhausted. Oh, they must be like on drugs or they must be, but I know, I know what it's like. And, and I've seen it in other artists and artist friends and it's sincerely, uh, a trip and it if you're not ready for it like it will bite you and and if you haven't if you're not completely healthy or mentally strong and capable it's it's a lot man and it's the, the coolest thing i've ever done and it's my favorite thing but it's like man i love it and i'm not mad like i'm not i'm not uh i'm so grateful for everything i've gotten to do but like it's it kind of eats you up. It totally does. Just the grind. The and I didn't know. I didn't know myself. I didn't have it. I had a million identities. You know what I mean? Like, there's a line in one of my songs, and it was on. It's on Pop Psychology, and which that album is basically me talking about my identity and my identity crisis, and, and that's initially what I went in to the therapist talking about. Um, I was like, you know, I I don't know who I am. I have a lot of things that I've never faced or worked through or worked on um and i need to do that and i immediately wanted to talk about being gay and she did it she didn't she didn't what we we didn't even really talk about sexuality which i look at it now and it's kind of awesome because she was so she was so into like getting to what what it really was you know and she made it very she made it very clear that you need to just be happy with who you are. And so it was never my take home every time I would come home um, was was it's okay to have flip outs. It's okay to it's okay to be angry at times. It's just how you deal with that. It's how it's 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 a matter of forgiveness. It's a matter of uh, growth. It's a matter of of uh transparency and being honest with how you feel and and I you know it, and it was a real process of just unfiling just like unfiling all of these all of the shame and all of this like um stuff that I had built to create like these different personas and um and it was just by the end of those those sessions and and my time with that with that woman, it became apparent to me like, oh, okay, I just have to come out now. Like it became like, oh, that's, that. okay, that's easy. Like it wasn't, it was the first time in, the, in my whole life that it wasn't scary because I was, I think I just realized I had to get happy with who, who Tyler, Tyler was like, and realizing, no, you're, you're actually not consumed by some evil spirit and in fact, you need to, to be happy and whole with who, who you are and, uh, and own that. And, and um, I know it sounds so basic and, and sort of simple, but like I just had to get right with myself. And then the other, everything else seemed to just like fall into place. Like, all right, well, I guess the next step is to come out. How am I going to come out? So with her, with the therapist, you never actually talked about being gay. No, I, 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 I did. I she knew, but like she would, she, she'd always do that thing where it was like, well, let's go back to like, let's go back to childhood, or let's go back to, to why you know why why did you re like it was a lot about like behavior, behavior and like learned behavior and less about like. I, I was she, she trying to come up with a reason why you were gay? No, I think she wanted to prove that like like sexuality is is, is actually just a part. It's not. It's not. It's not the you're whole thing. A, you're a bigger person than just you're your bigger than your sexuality. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's was, pretty cool. It was awesome. I don't know if it definitely felt inspired at the time. I don't know. Like that was what I needed to hear. I definitely did not need to go to a reparative therapist. A lot of people asked if you ever. Experimented with that or no, had any no. experience with it? Good. I, I think coming out late as late as I did, I don't think it was that. 
a hot thing to do. I know Chris's brother, um, I think, did a little, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, don't quote me on that. But I, I think I remember that happening. But uh, I began, so I, just, I began writing a record and, uh, and we started playing shows again. And, um, and, then, and then that summer of 2013, we had written the record and, um, and I realized I was coming out in this record. Like, cause really it was the openness of like being, and everyone kind of noticed like a change in my, I guess my countenance or the way I was kind of <laughs> carrying myself. Like, like in their mind, darker or lighter? Lighter. Really? Yeah. Like all of a sudden, like. Were they thinking more righteous, more like probably, churchy? Probably. I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. I, I was so focused on just being happy and 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 as honest as, as I could be. Um, and now, at this point, you hadn't really come out to people, though. No, no. You just yet. realized that you needed to. I needed to. And I, I was writing music, and, it, and it, the music, I was coming out in the songs, like, you know, like half of those songs, like, are super apparent, at least to me. I mean, obviously, I lived the experience, but. I wonder if your bandmates were listening to those songs and getting a little nervous. I don't know. <laughs> they didn't love sleeping with a friend. Like, they were like, wait. And I was like, well, it's like my version of a sexy song. Like, you know, like it's not, I'm not, I don't know. Like I always felt like I kind of had to like explain to them so that they would be comfortable with some of the like risque stuff sometimes. Like even when that song came out, I'm like, oh, that's just about like falling asleep next to a friend. That's yeah. how I, yeah, I knew, reason. I knew who it was about, you know, it was, a, and I, once I told them who it was about, then they were like, oh, that makes sense. So it was about a, a guy? That yeah, it was a, a friend that he's married to a woman still now. No, well, now, not still. He wasn't married at the time, but I, I'm sure he probably watches your podcast, so I probably won't talk too much about him. No, that I wouldn't watch too. But it's about it's about having sex with a guy? I mean, ha that having, Sleeping with a friend, okay, having okay. a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, pretty, it's pretty pointed. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's songs about like, Definitely about identity on there. There's a song called "Living in Another World" that is love that song. About, thanks. Well, I love you. I, 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 the song that I was introduced to that song at the Equality Utah banquet, where you right. sang it as a ballad, and it stripped down. There wasn't a dry eye in the house when you sing that song. Ah, thank you. That I loved. I loved doing it that way. That so good. It's cool. Thank you. I think it. I think the recorded version kind of is a little sometimes a little rock in that, but that, yeah, it's truly like my, I think that's like my banner coming out song in a way. Cause it's, it's completely about being, being unhappy with yourself and and finding, I, I truly felt like, you know, compartmentalizing. I, I truly felt like I was like living in an, in another, I was living in my own, my own sort of existence, my own world. Um, so yeah, I was just writing music that felt, there was even a song where I, we, we had talked about having um, a guy duet, duet on one of the songs. And my producer was like, why do you want a guy? It might sound like it's like a love song. And I, I was like, oh, I just. <laughs> That'd be terrible. <laughs> uh, the song's called I Love You But I Hate Your Friends. And it really isn't like a love song, but I just thought, I was like, oh, it's cool. But he's like, yeah, it kind of sounds like you're in a relationship on it. So maybe like. And I watched the video of that, and it's with a guy, right? Yeah. But that must have been after. Oh, that's uh, songs I can't Did listen I? to. Okay, sorry. Go that was after. Confused. That okay, was after. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no worries. Uh, yeah. So eventually, uh, I was just like, "Well, Tim, like, all right, do you want to know what this music's about?" And I was, I was texting him because I was on a plane. So I was on a plane, flying to Indiana where my grandparents live and my uncle and my mom's brother and my mom and my dad and everyone were going because we were all going to visit my grandparents. So I was the only Glenn kid that was going, but my, my grandparents are pretty old and we try to make it a point to go once or once a year, or once every two years. And so I just finished the record and, and he was texting, Tim was texting me. He's my producer and it was we were talking probably about the record or how exciting it was or how, how great the experience was making it. And I'm like, all right, well, can I, can I just tell you something like what these songs are about? <laughs> and <clears throat> he, uh, 
He's like, yeah. And I was like, all right, well, um, you know, I'm gay. I've known since I was three. I, I said, I, I probably rounded way, way down because I didn't know when, when I was three, but I was just like, I've known my whole life and these songs are, um, these songs are about that. And um, I was so nervous. And I, I was watching like the dot, dot, dot on the iPhone, like, and then like it would stop and then like, it, and then it would go dot. And I was like, oh, like, what's he writing? And I, he's like, Tyler, uh, I love you. And I'm so, and this was the thing that like blew my mind. He's like, I'm so excited for you. And I was like, what? And it was, it was literally the first time that I had ever associated um, positive or um, like goodness with being gay or like being myself or, or my orientation. And, and it like, that was like one of those, uh, one of a few in my whole life, but mind, mind blowing experiences where I was like, like, whoa. And it like the whole perspective changed. And I literally wanted to like, tell the whole plane that I was gay. Like I wanted to like, <laughs> like tap my ear and go like, can I tell you something? <laughs> like I, I was so pumped. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, I'm flying in. And so the whole trip I'm with my family and my grandparents, I'm like, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna tell. And so my producer like calls me every couple of days. He's like, hey, have you, how's it going out there? Like, <laughs> have you told anyone? I was like, no, like, I haven't found the right time and you know, the vibe's really good. So I don't really want to like, you know, put a stick in the spoke, so to speak. Like, I don't want to like, you know, rain on everyone's bread. So <clears throat> the trip, trip ends and my mom and I are driving to the airport and I'm leaving to go to New York to do a music video, sleeping with a friend and, and do the photos for pop psychology record. And so I'll be meeting my band there. And, um, and I remember like so nervous in the car and I'm just like, mom, I have something I have to, I have to tell you. And she was like, okay. And, uh, and, uh, and it kind of just all came stumbling out. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gay. And she's like, no, you're not. I was like, no, I'm, yeah, I'm gay. And, it, um, and, uh, I want you to know that like, that like I want, I don't want this to change our relationship and um, I still love the church and I still love you guys. And, um, and this just, I have to, I have to come out. I have to, I ha like, it's important to me. I have to live my truth. Um, and she, she tells me now, but she remembers just looking over and seeing like, seeing like her like fully grown son, but like she, she swore she saw me like as like a 10 year old, like just like this little kid again, like needing his, his parent. And, um, and she was just so, <clears throat> so amazing, but like, so she knew nothing about it. Like, but she never cared and she never felt like it was a bad thing. So she, she was just like, okay, this is like something new for me. And like, I just hope people won't treat you different. And I hope, She's like, I don't want you to be hurt. Like that's, I'm your mother. And like, so that, like it, it was beautiful. It was like the second, it was the second experience of coming out and it was so good. Um, and so then she's like, well, you need to tell your dad, you know, and I'm going to tell your dad if you don't tell your dad. So you, you need, you need to call him. I was like, ah, I was like, he's probably the last person like on the list of people I want to call. Like, and, uh, cause you were mentioning that maybe in the high school years, he struggled a bit with, well, he had, he had like, he never struggled, but he, we weren't raised in a home that was like, it was never prejudice or racist or, uh, you know, bigotous at all. But like my older brother would casually use fag, you know, like, or, or, or that's gay. You know, I think maybe that was a, a product of the times, the nineties, and maybe that's just like a slang term. And my, I remember Brokewick Mountain coming out and like, we're a big Oscars family watcher. And I remember that movie, um, it was like, I think it was 2005. And I had seen it with friends and no one was phased by that. It was just a movie that I saw. But I remember my older brother kind of like, like, why, why would you want to see a movie about two cowboys doing, doing gay stuff? Like kind of, kind of stuff like that, where he's a great, great person, but it just wasn't in, our, in their world to like, they were never affected by that. So it was like, it was weird. It was sort of taboo, but 
like they can do that, but like, you know, kind of thing. I, I think I remember you saying that maybe your dad, your appearance in high school was a little bit hard for him at times. Oh, my, my dads and I, our biggest, our biggest wars were always over the way I looked. So it's kind of superficial. Um, I think he knew I was a good kid because he would defend me. I remember like when I was kind of going through my thing, I was still going to church every Sunday. Um, and, but my, but my dad, like, I remember a lot of leaders would like pull him aside and say, you know, Tyler's in trouble. Or I, I remember, I think I showed up to like a beach youth activity and um, pulled out like a clove cigarette and like s- smoked at the youth activity not because I wanted to, but just because like I, I knew it was going to like ruffle feathers. And I remember the bishop pulling him aside on, on the Sunday m- meetings before the word met and, uh, and saying like, Tyler's gone off the deep end. Like you need to, you know, you need to rein him in. And like, I remember my dad like coming home and like saying that he defended me in, in, in those meetings and knew that my heart was good. And, um, which was cool. Like, so we had a good relationship, but we didn't in a way. Like the breakthrough moment for me was when going on my mission. And I remember the, <clears throat> I was getting emotional about these stuff, these things. My, we were, we were staying at the residence in, in Provo. It's like right around the corner from the MTC. And it's that, you know, it's that morning where you're like going to MC and saying goodbye to your parents. And my dad just starts bawling in the bathroom, like apologizing. And I, I'm like, I'm apologizing too. And we just have this like breakthrough moment. And then I think another reason why I loved my mission so much was um, getting to know my dad through letters and, um, <clears throat> and like, I don't know that, like that, that was like an important, uh, important part of our relationship. And I think a great f- I'd like to say foundation to what it is now. I, I really like genuinely love my dad. I also think he's like one of the funniest people on earth and he's not really known for being funny, but I just think my dad's amazing and funny. And um, so I, I definitely, I mean, that's another huge, huge part of my mission that I left out, but like that connection I had with, with my dad. Cause like my mom would, was like the most faithful writer. I think I had a, like in some areas I had a letter every day. Like she, she timed it out, but it was just like to make sure I felt loved, like, which is amazing that, that I had that, that privilege and opportunity. But like my dad, they were a little more few and far between, but they were always like, you could tell he had written them like probably in priesthood or like when the lesson was boring or like in sacrament meeting, but like they were like eight page letters and um, super spiritual and super just like, we had really good, good conversation through letters. And so that was, that was cool. So my dad became super supportive really when the band took off and didn't really care anymore about how I looked like almost like liked, I think because everyone else, he's always been a guy that like, like always asking, well, what does that guy think about that? Like, like, oh, uh, they like it. Okay. Okay, maybe maybe I can improve of this. Like, so when he would see like throngs of crowds of people like singing along and like, you know, really into our band, I think it like let it let him let his hair down a little bit. Now he has shoes like and like a leather moto jacket and like dresses up for the shows and like he's like this bald like middle aged or old white guy now, but like dances. It's like kind of embarrassing, but but yeah, no, I love my dad. So coming out to him. So yeah, it was, uh, that was nerve wracking. Cause I knew if any, if any relationship was going to be affected, like it was only, it was a matter of getting it out to people that I knew I wasn't going to lose. But like to my dad, there was in the back of my mind and kind of in, probably in the forefront of my mind, there was definitely this element of risk. Like, like I'd gotten used to having my dad call and, you know, I didn't always pick up, but when I did, like we, we had hilarious talks and I just like appreciated that we were at that point and, um, that, that closeness. And I had that, you know, I had that parental approval that I'd always sought as a, as a, as a kid. And, um, you know, I wasn't that dad hater anymore. Like I love, and I love my father. It was great. So there was that element of like, is this going to 
cause that division again, you know? And not to say that my dad's like a small person, but I didn't doubt his heart and that his love, but like it was a genuine fear. And I, I can't speak to it for everyone, but I think like, I think that's a part of it. You're, you're scared of losing, losing your family or friends. And you hear, you hear horror, horror stories about that kind of thing. So I was in New York in a hotel room and I had a video camera cause I'd been document, I document a lot when I'm in the studio and I'd, I'd been, you know, recording a lot of that process. And I set my camera up and um, on me and I put the phone on speaker and I called my dad and it's like a 20 minute video. So I guess it was like a 20 minute phone call with my father. And we, I probably talked for like 15 minutes about like nothing with him. Like it was very like, cool, what are you doing? And I also <laughs> wanted to make sure like he was um, not driving, like not behind the wheel. Like I was like, could you like pull to the side of the road or, <laughs> or like, or like, uh, let me know when you're like, or call me back when you're, you know, at your play, uh, destination or whatever. Um, Cause he was on a business trip. Um, he's like, that's oh, okay. You know, was, you know, and I, I told him and he didn't, he was like, you are? I was like, yeah, like I, uh, I am. He's like, <sighs> he's like, well, you know that I love you and I know, you know that, you know that, that this, that I'm not going to look at you any different, but you, you need to know that I don't necessarily understand it and I don't necessarily agree with it. And I don't, and I was like, well, I need you to ask questions. Like I need you, like I'm an open book right now. Like I'm in, I don't know what it is, but like I, you know, I'm, I'm completely open. And if you have any questions, I need you to ask me. And like, you know, like, I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't want you to think that I get it either. Like, I just want you to know, like, this is who I, this is who, like, who I am because this is my orientation. This is like been a part of like why I've been so depressed and sad my whole life. Like, cause I haven't faced this, like, this is important. And he's like, well, I just don't know how people get to the point where they like, where guys, get and get to like guys like he's like I just I've never liked any other men before and I was like well dad it's like like you're not gonna like men because you're not gay <laughs> and I don't expect you to, to maybe understand that and I also want you to know like it's not like every man I've ever met or been friends with I've been sexually tried to it's just like not how it works and uh and I think we kind of I was like he's like well it's gonna it's going to take some time. And I was like, I, I totally understand that. And, uh, and then I, I kind of broke down a little bit and he was the only person I was emotional with, like as far as like physically. And it was just me explaining to him that I didn't want our relationship to change. I was like, dad, like this is, it's super important that this doesn't affect our relationship. And he kind of made a joke towards the end of the conversation. Like, yeah, well, if, you know, if you want to hang up and then call me back and say you're just kidding, like, that's okay. I was like, great. All right. So it, it was better than I thought, but it wasn't like a glowing, like it wasn't, I, I wouldn't give that conversation a glowing review, like a 10 out of 10. But, and then it kind of sucked because I didn't hear from him for like three weeks. And so I called him out on it and I was like, hey, I, I think I was home might have been like around for Christmas at that point or Thanksgiving. It was definitely like I was home for a reason. And I called him out and I was like, hey, like, you know, you said you wouldn't let this be weird. And I, I noticed you haven't been calling. And he is like, I think, I think he's still like, I was, oh, wait, I remember this. We were, we were shopping for last minute Christmas gifts and he hadn't, he hadn't bought anything for my mom yet. Cause he's always been super late on that. And and uh, he was like, well, what would you get for your wife? And I was like, well, I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, it would probably be a husband. And uh, I'm not even in a relationship right now. So I don't know. And he, and he was like, well, don't. I, I think he was super pumped on the idea that maybe I'd be in a relationship with Taylor Swift, which is really hilarious, too. Because, <laughs> like, that's not even. 
<laughs> like that's so bizarre. But he was just like, what about that? He would always say like, like what about that Taylor Swift girl? Or <laughs> what about like any sort of like semi-famous girl? Like, so I, it took him a minute to definitely latch on to the idea that this was like not just a phase and also not like a, not like a, a, cho a choice or not like a, a thing I just decided to do. Um, you know, cause I, I always decided to dress weird. I, I always decided I was going to be in music. I, so for him, like these kind of radical seeming like sort of unorthodox choices in life, like, uh, like perhaps being gay was also one of those things. Um, now, like just, just to fast forward and then we can obviously go back, but just like a, he's, he's incredible. And like, I really feel like he's become an ally and um, still doesn't probably get all of it, but like is so like open and super understanding that it's, that it's not a choice. So that's been cool. It's been good progress, <laughs> but yeah, so that was a, it's a big deal. And then that trip, I ended up coming out to my bandmates it was like a very heavy trip. It should have been like this light, like, oh, we're doing a photo shoot and making a music video. Um, but after I'd gotten my parents out of the way, it was like, I was kind of like, cool. I just want to like get this out of the way now. So I took my bandmates one by one into, I, I, you know, hit them up. And I actually didn't tell Chris until like super late because I figured he didn't, never cared. And he was like the safe one. I also didn't want him telling, which is kind of weird now, like I didn't want him telling his family because I was afraid, this is a sincere thought I had, I had seen his family leave the church and I didn't want my family to leave the church because I was gay. But, and from the outside looking into the Allens, at the time it seemed like Matt, their son had come out and slowly but surely all of them had left the church and, and that was an automatic unhappiness to me. Like I was like, and I did not want to be responsible for, which is stupid to think like I shouldn't, like everyone's testimony or belief should be strong enough personally where that shouldn't affect it. But so I didn't, I didn't want any word of it coming out to, to, uh, Chris's family. So I told him last, but, but they had already left the church. I know, but I thought they would probably tell ward members or it would get around or it was a lot about me making sure it was coming from my mouth and that I could explain it. Okay. And I think that's why some of it led into like coming out in the way I did. Because it goes back to your home ward. Yeah. And maybe that was like, it's looking at it now, it's probably an irrational fear of mine. But like, it was just like, I, it was all about like, I want to control the way this, the way this is seen as much as I can before I can't anymore. Um, so I came out to, to Brandon who I had sort of mentioned years prior and he had sort of maybe thought that I had coming, which I can't confirm or deny, but it, that was definitely the vibe I got. But uh, he was like, wow, like, uh, and then he sort of confessed to, um, he was like, he's like, well, okay, so I've heard a rumor that um, someone saw you drinking at a bar. And I, and it so it immediately turned into, to like the word of wisdom or something as to like, I was like, wait, like I'm coming out to you as a gay man. I make, uh, you know, but, and he was like, well, I, you know, like you can tell me if, if you're drinking now. And I was like, I was like, no, I don't consider myself like, I'm not really like, you know, maybe occasion occasionally, but that, that I was like, I want you to know that has nothing to do with me like coming out or like, y you know, like, so that was, that was weird, but he's like super supportive at that point and just like, was like, wow, this is weird. Like, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, you thinking maybe, and like, I'm, you know, I'm happy for you. And the Campbells have always been supportive of their gay friends. So like that wasn't too worrisome. And then I told Elaine and Elaine had a really emotional reaction to it, which I appreciated. Um, because her and I, I felt like we were always, I always felt closeness to her, but I always felt like there was, there was some sort of wall between us a lot of the times. And that probably goes back to stuff 
stuff on her end and stuff on my end. And, and like I said, we were all kind of living these like isolated lives while being in the same room and the same band. Um, but she, I, I appreciated her expression of support. I appreciated her, her questions of like how that must've been so hard for you. You know, she got emotional. Um, we went to lunch the next day and she, she, um, you know, she ex- expressed that she sincerely believed that God knew my, knew my situation, um, which made me feel supported. And, and, uh, and that was that. And then, and then when it got a little, a little more real was when I told them that, that I had an opportunity to come out in, in Rolling Stone magazine. And to me, it was like, I'd gone from years of thinking I'm never going to come out and that's fine. I don't need to come out. Like, why do people have to come out to then needing, needing the world to know. And when I say the world, the people that knew neon trees are needing, needing the fan base to know or whatever. Cause I, I felt like it was an important part of me that I needed to express. It shaped the album. It added a layer to the band that I felt like was important that I feel like sometimes critic wise, we were, we were a radio band or we were, you know, we, we wrote some hit songs, but I think I felt like there was a story here. There was, I feel like getting, I felt like, like it would add a depth to the music and, and let people really look at it in a different way. And, uh, and so I went, I remember going to the Rolling Stone offices and meeting with, with a potential writer and like the head editor and I remember just like bawling my eyes out in the Rolling Stone offices. And um, the writer was a lesbian and she like was like, you're, she's like, you need to stop crying. You're going to have so much fun. Like this is, she's like, I'm so like, I'm so thrilled to be able to do this story. And, and she's like, we're going to come out to Provo, Utah. And we're going to like, I'm going to be with you like for a few days. And we're, I'm going to really make sure that this is a well-rounded thing. Cause that was my concern too. I was like, scary liberal music magazine is going to exploit the church and I'm going to be held responsible for whatever, you know, whatever outcome. And so she, she eventually, she, she comes out to, to Provo. I'm living in Pleasant Grove at the time. And it's her and my publicist and my publicist has only ever lived in LA, New York and London and so like Utah and Nebraska or like any sort of middle mushy area like is super foreign and weird to her. And they were just like, they were super like, this is an alien world. And I took them to like Mr. Mac in the university mall. And um, I was like, yeah, there's, this is a huge missionary department store that you can get all your stuff. And, and I took them and they were like so enthralled that like there was so many soda restaurants, like, they're like, these are like bars, but for like Mormons. And I was like, yeah, like everyone's just getting jacked up on caffeine. Um, I was like, yeah. And like, I, I remember, I think one of them wanted to get a drink at the event. I, I took him to Valor to see a local show. And and I was like, no, like there's no alcohol. Like, yeah, like, but there, there's pie shakes around the corner. And so I, like we went and got like pie shakes at that Sammy's by, in Provo. They were just like, it was like prime Provo Friday night. So they just like got the full, full dose. And I think by the second, definitely by the third day, I think they found some sort of relaxing charm about it and kind of got why I stayed there. Um, But uh, we got into heavy discussions about, about it. I mean, I pulled out the magazine, but and people can read it online. But. Kisses on the front, front Kisses cover. Kisses on the front cover. That was the band of one of the bands of my youth. <laughs> I like that. My my front cover headline is "Gay Moron and Finally Out" on uh, <laughs> Gene, have your on, name. on Gene Simmons' leg. That's pretty dope. <laughs> love gun on his love gun. Love gun on his love gun. <laughs> um, so this was shot like in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Just put photo. I mean, I have a you know photo with with my brother, you know, coming home from my mission, or this might've been during my mission. Uh, 
And it was like very, the story was just very much about how I'm gay and Mormon. And I never, I was, I was stoked on the story because I thought, A, it was really fair towards the church and they could have totally ripped the church to shreds and used it to their advantage and they didn't. I, I would like to take some credit for definitely like painting it in, in the light that I believed in it, uh, it to be. And I, I, uh, but I didn't know that I was coming out as a gay Mormon per se. And part of that was important to me, but only really to the local fan base and to like sort of the LDS side of our fan base. But our, our, by then our, you know, we were, we were in an international rock band. So it was like, to, I don't know, but they really liked the complexity of being gay and Mormon. And, um, and it was sort of, you know, it was a time like Mitt Romney had, had just, uh, had just ran. And I feel like the church had also, they'd started becoming a little more publicly accepting or, or so I thought, and like Mormons and gays.com was made by the church. And, um, you know, my biggest mission coming out as a gay Mormon was to, to eliminate continue to eliminate the stereotype and continue and the fallout from that was the amount of love I got from church members that I've never met to this day in my life like on 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 all of the social media like like I'm talking thousands and thousands and thousands of messages like um and then also the amount of love and support I got from like gay religious people that like were like thank you for coming out and proving that you can still believe in god and be gay like that was and that again just made me feel like i'm doing such a this is a good thing like like i'm having like high councilmen right in from different wards and stakes i've never been to saying you're doing a good thing you know that i know that the church is opening up and like this is coming from like people pretty you know, pretty high up, even if it's like regional status, but it's like, like, these are, these are people that like know general authorities and like, so like, I'm like, that's awesome. And like, I got, I started getting invited to like, uh, I was like, I don't know what to formally call it, but they were sort of like VIP church events where like authorities, general authorities would speak or they were like socials for, for like prominent Mormons or whatever. So I felt like it was all, I also got kind of a blessing from the church, like, Cause it was very public and well known. Like it was in this magazine, but it, you know, the next morning I was on CNN, I was on E News, I was on Howard Stern. Like I was, I was on all of these, and that was crazy. I was trending on Facebook. Like I was like, who the hell cares about this like random singer guy from Utah coming out as gay and Mormon? But everyone was really fixating on the Mormon aspect, like. Everyone was like, oh, we probably thought he was gay because of those suits he wears. And like, you know, he's a pretty flashy dancer, and which, you know, wasn't great. Um, and I remember writing like a big, I was on my, I was on my toilet. It was like the next day and I was just like ferociously writing um, a Facebook post. And it was just like all coming out again. And um, Huffington Post picked it up and it was just like very much like, um, like driving it home that like that I I had struggled so long and I, it it basically became like the come out as you thing like I wanted people to know that like if you're if you're afraid to do something go do it or if 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 you believe in something come out about it like that that was became I I turned it into like let's not focus on my sexuality. Let's focus on the fact that like, I feel like I'm a happy person and you can be too. And if it's not sexuality, that's your thing that you have to think about or, or come to terms with, then it's, you know, look inside yourself and become whole and happy with who you are. And, and, uh, and so for the, the rest of that touring cycle and press cycle on, on pop psychology, it was, it was coming out every night on stage. It was um, a moment in the show where, where, you know, the lights dim and I'm, and I'm, you know, crying and and yelling into the microphone about, um, 
you know, these things are just coming out of me and I feel like I'm, I'm bearing, you know, I'm bearing testimony. I'm feeling, I'm sincerely feeling the spirit. I'm sincerely feeling like I'm doing something important. And, um, and I, it was, I felt like I was finally close with God again. And I started, I started praying more than I ever prayed before again. I felt like sort of worthy. And it, it was like, wow, like, hold up. Like this, this was a risk, but I am actually making it work. I'm, I'm a gay Mormon and it's okay. And it's, it's actually like, I'm being, I'm, I'm being blessed by doing this. Um, and you know, I, I spoke at affirmation, uh, which is, a an LGBTQ, it's not necessarily affiliated and you can help me. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily sanctioned by the church, but it's a, it's put on for, for members, it's put on for for ex Mormons. It's it, it's anyone that's been affected by the church and and the LGBTQ community. And so that was a a, a beautiful night, you know. And this that was just a few months ago in September. And uh, two thousand fifteen. Two thousand fifteen. And I just have to tell you, I remember that article and I remember you coming out. I'm like, what's, what's he going to say? And when the message came through gay Mormon, I'm like, I had to sit with that. I had to sit with that. And, um, not, not just, I'm just telling you my reaction. I was just like, on the one hand, awesome. Like Mormonism is, is expanding. Right. Yeah. And Tyler's breaking new ground. And yeah, I was like, this is, there's a way that this is really awesome. And then there was another way where maybe I was starting to see the writing on the wall for me and my story and how I was being treated. And I had seen. Because your work at that time was really focused. I was getting a PhD in this. Right, right, right. (laughs) And treating clients all the time and, and seeing, you know, them struggle and, and seeing how it played out and, and I, there was a part of me that was just also saying, oh, can, will, will it last? Like, can it last? Is this something, because no one's ever really been explicit about this publicly at such a high profile level. And is the church ready? Will they, will they really welcome him and people like him? Is, is he setting, you know, I think I probably thought, is he setting people up for disappointment or is he breaking new ground? And I, I honestly don't, I don't think I knew the answer, right. but I was just like, oh my gosh, how is this going to play out? I think that's. Those are the same quite I mean, <laughs> oh, uh, talk about pressure too, though. Like yeah. looking back at it, but it was such a, I was riding such a high wave of like being out and like being accepted. And I totally recognize that my coming out story is different than, and it's probably not the norm. But like I <laughs> probably not, <laughs> obviously not. But like even on just a level of like uh, take take any sort of like profile I have or whatever, or the level of which I came out or the forum I came out in, I recognize that like there are still to this day people coming out that lose their family, that lose their homes, you know, in the church, definitely out of the church, but like super. super it's so heavy in the church still. And so I realized like, I didn't, I didn't lose a friend. I didn't, you know, I didn't, no family member relationship really changed because of that. Um, So, so I was riding a really high wave. And so there was that. And then there was also just like every, every, and it was so much press, like every gay outlet wanted to talk to me about, about it. And I was ready to be like, okay, cool. Like you guys got the news now. Like let's like back to the music or back, you know, like, but it's still. You probably didn't want to be the gay pop star. I didn't right? want to be the gay pop star. But then I also kind of said in that, in that interview, like, is the world ready for like an openly gay pop star? Obviously I realized there were like, there, I'm not, I'm not the first openly gay, like, like singer. But Michael uh, Stipe was bisexual. George Michael came out after. He sure. was kind of caught. Sure. Elton John came out way after, sure. right? Like, at, like Adam Lambert, someone I regret not mentioning because like he was an openly gay, like he came out and, and uh, in, in Rolling Stone as well. But uh, I, 
I just thought like, you know, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm not just a pop star. I, I come from the alternative rock world too. And there's, you know, I, I just didn't know. And, and I also kind of felt like gay bands, I didn't want to be a gay band. I didn't want Neon Trees to be a gay band. I didn't, and I hope that doesn't sound, I hope that's coming, like, I hope I can explain that, but it's like- You want to be a band. I just want to be a band. Like, just like as much as I didn't want to be a Mormon band, I didn't want to be- I don't run around saying I'm heterosexual. Right, right, <laughs> right. That's... But I also feel like a lot, maybe up into that time, but like I felt like a lot of bands, once their singers came out or, or maybe once an artist of theirs came out or once they played too many pride events, like they got kind of typecast as a gay man and so they were only playing those events. And, you know, we got hit up a lot to play at certain pride festivals. And I, and I was choosy because I was, we, I think we did one in Chicago and that, that was amazing. And it, I am now like you, you're speaking to me now, like I am so proud to be, a, to be a gay man. I'm proud to be out. I'm, but, it, and it, I don't think about it every day. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not walking to get a sandwich and thinking about the guys that I want to have sex with. Like, that's just not <laughs> happening. Like, it's just not. So like, it's just, I wake up in the morning, like everyone else, like, so I wanted it to kind of just the dust to settle, but the record became like the, it became the coming out, my coming out record. Um, when it really, it really wasn't like I, I wrote a lot of that material prior to coming out. So really the, the coming out record is yet to be written. Like, in a way, like, um, I, I haven't really written music about, about that, that post coming out life, I guess, um, which is fascinating, but there's just kind of a level where I just want to be able to, I want to be able to use the pronoun he without someone saying, making it an issue or making it a headline. I want to be able to just like, write. I've always written what I know. Why can't I do that now? Oh, with like a boyfriend in a song or something. Sure. Sure. I, I mean, the, uh, there's a music video we released over the summer for a song that we released before we went out on this last tour. And it's the first music video where the relationship that I have is with, is with the guy. And that, that alone, is that lesson, what it's is called that? Uh, Songs I Can't Listen Songs to. Songs I Can't Listen to You. Um, but the, the guy- Is that a friend or a model? That's that? Dustin Lance Black who wrote Milk. Oh, that was him? Dustin Lance Black. <laughs> used to be Mormon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we kind of had that. That's that's. So he played your that's boyfriend. Lance. Yeah. So he plays my boyfriend. He's getting married to to Tom, the diver, the big UK, UK Olympic diver, um, which is funny. But but yeah, we hit it off though. We we're like, it was great working with him. He was way I, making that video. I was still super defensive about the church though, or not. And he, I think a lot of people assumed that I was out or out of the church or like had moved on or, but I still. I still completely believed in its teachings. I, I would, you would never hear me blaming God or the church for any of my problems. You would never hear me making light of, of the temple. Um, I mean, every now and then when you'd, when you'd say, when you'd hear someone say, we should, we will go down or, or like, you can get anything in this world with money, like, you know, temple video lines, you would like kind of look at each other and like smile. But beyond that, I wasn't, I was treating those things as sacred. Um, and, you know, th there were times even when Chris and my band would say, oh, but you're not Mormon. Like even Chris, like, and I was like, no, but I, I am. Like, like I'm telling you, like, and, and then that got me, the conversation started like, well, what is being a Mormon? Like, what, what does that mean? Does that mean like, is it really about drinking coffee and, and abstaining is it really like all of those superficial worldly things or is it really like your testimony and belief in the Book of Mormon and the, the restoration and your relationship with with Christ and with God and the belief in the atonement and belief in the power of prayer? Like aren't those the aren't those the most important tenets of Mormonism? I don't know. Like and I'm just I would ask that question. Like those are things I still believe in. I st I pray as an openly gay man, like I feel that because I don't like a lot of it going to church on Sunday became 
a task because it kind of turned into a meet and greet every Sunday, sacrament meeting. So when I would, you know, I'd go occasionally at my parents' house or I'd go occasionally, you know, uh, here in Utah. But it, it was like, is the point for me to go on Sundays is to feel the spirit, to take the sacrament and to, com- to commune with my Heavenly Father. So if I'm, if I'm not getting that, like why, why am I, I just didn't feel comfortable. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't like, it had nothing to do with like my, my lack of belief in the church at that point. Um, I don't know, I just went off on a tangent. But. No, that's not at all. That's, so, you, um, so you come out, were you worried about coming out affecting the sales of the album and did it? I mean, I think we know, but there was a there were a couple thoughts or opinions from from talking heads that would say like like uh, you know this this might this might affect your your fan base or this might that was a concern we we had a tour we had a couple shows planned in Utah over the course of that next year and that was something but but I remember. The, the tour stop here in Salt Lake was, was sold out. Uh, didn't feel an ounce of, of of anything. Did you feel the opposite? Maybe some extra love or maybe? Something? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, the the coolest part was playing last last fall in Provo, Utah, for like Provo, Utah. <laughs> like you don't know where that's at <laughs> in Provo uh, on the street. For like eleven thousand people, and like like m- probably most, I was like BYU kids, and I was talking about. I remember talking about like um, a gay app I was on. I was like, yeah, like I, you know, because I I would use those apps to at that point after coming out, I wasn't hooking up anymore. I wasn't living a secret life. Like that's another thing I need to tell you. Like it's that it like melded the. T- unfiled everything and it made me a whole person or so I thought like I I definitely felt like oh I'm one person I'm transparent and everything I do needs to be in that way and there's no more secrets anymore and um that was a promise I made to myself so so you know I would have I think I had a an app called scruff or something on and uh and uh I think I even even briefly mentioned that like a dating app it's like a dating app. I, people would call it a hookup app. I didn't use it for that. <laughs> um, since then, I, I deleted those. Uh, mostly because it's like most people don't believe that it's actually me here in Utah. Like they're always like, they're like, what? Like, why are you using Tyler Glenn's picture? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so annoying. <laughs> so, uh, but I remember making references to that. I, Long story short, I was super transparent and open. And if anyone missed the memo, you know. Um, but I also wasn't in your in your in their face about it. I was just like I was Tyler and I was performing and I was loose and and that was an amazing show. And there was some like chatter like how's how's uptight Utah County gonna deal with this? But to be honest, like like you realize like I think like a take home from this whole experience as far as like coming out has been. Um, you're told, and granted there are hateful people still in this world and there's a lot of things that we as a community, as far as like of, you know, LGBTQA, whatever letters they've added to that whole title, but there's a lot of stuff that we still have to do and there's a lot of oppression, but I feel like I was told my whole life that everyone hates, hates me because I'm gay or hates my, hates my sexual orientation but I realized that the person that hated it the most was me. Like I hated it myself. It was me that sabotaged it a lot. And the beautiful life lesson is I really think there are a lot of really good people out there that that do do have love. And that's also been a thing where I think coming out is it is important because like it's it just continues to like not only added the conversation that we're not, we're not these weirdos, we're just people. And also that like, you probably have friends and family that are also gay and struggling and, and 
and the time is now to stop that. Like it's, it's devastating, um, still locally, like, um, meeting, meeting so many like closeted, um, closeted married Mormon men or married Mormon men trying to make it work or, or married Mormon men that come out and, and, uh, come out in their forties and fifties and, and I watch them and they're so unhappy and, and, uh, or they think they're happy. I don't know. There's just like this, this, the stigma has got to go. Like we've got to be able to just eliminate that, but it's a whole other, it's a whole other podcast. Thank you for joining us today on Mormon Stories Podcast. To discuss this podcast with others, please check us out at mormonstories.org. To join one of our 80 plus support communities across the globe, click on the support communities tab at mormonstories.org. To keep this podcast alive, please consider a tax deductible donation today by becoming a monthly subscriber at mormonstories.org. Audio and video for this podcast were provided by Richard Holdman. A big thanks to the Saber Rattlers for providing the music for today's episode. The Mormon Stories logo was generously donated by studiocase.com. Come, come, ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy when you're with.